This is a 1994 Porsche 928 GTS. You may know a little about the 928. Maybe your uncle had one, or some guy down the street from you has one, or you owned one yourself back in the 90s, but not that many people know this. The 928 GTS, the ultimate final iteration of the 928, this one, sold new back in 1994 for $88,000, which is equivalent to $180,000 in today's money. Today, I'm gonna to take you on a comprehensive tour of the 928 using this one, this 94 928 GTS. And I'm gonna show you all of this car's weirdnesses and quirks and cool features. There are many. I'm gonna start by giving you a thorough tour of all the weird quirks and features of this 928 GTS, which, by the way, comes to me from Platinum Motor Cars, an exotic car dealer here in the lovely Detroit area, whose inventory is so wild and vast and varied that going in there is like a cars and coffee. Then I'm gonna take it out on the road and see how it drives. But first, an overview. The 928 was sold from 1977 to 1995, nearly 20 years with the same basic design. It's a front-engine V8, unlike every other Porsche sports car, and it was originally intended to replace the 911, but it never did. More on that at the end of the video. This 928 is an odd car, a weird hodgepodge of 70s and 80s and 90s, and this GTS is the ultimate version. It was sold for only three years at the very end of the 928 run, and it had 350 horsepower, which is still a lot today, and was really really a lot back then. If the 928 ever becomes collectible, this is the one that'll shoot up in value. Okay, time for the quirks and features, starting with the front and one of the 928's most famous design traits. It's headlights. Now, pop-up headlights were not uncommon on cars from this era, but most other pop-up cars concealed their headlights when they were down. In this car, the headlights were always visible, but when you turn them on, they did indeed pop up. <laughs> <laughs> the car looked like a frog when the headlights were up. It was so strange, and when you put them away, they weren't concealed, they just sort of rested. And speaking of lighting, let's discuss the key for a minute. This car doesn't have keyless entry or any of that newfangled stuff, but it does have one little trick. There's a giant button on the key, and when you push it, it becomes the world's dimmest flashlight. Next up, let's discuss possibly my favorite quirk on this entire car. That would be the 928's crazy rear window. You're looking at this rear three quarters window back here is one of the strangest I've ever seen on any car. This oddly shaped rhombus that starts upright and somehow finishes flat in various different angles throughout. This window has to be one of the strangest things to make and I strongly suspect it isn't cheap to buy now. If you own a 928, you're probably living in fear that someone's gonna break your rear three quarters window. Next, let's talk about the fuel door. It opens up just like a normal fuel door and inside there is a fuel cap with a lock on it, which was common cars that came out of the 70s due to the gas crisis. What's less common is the little flap between them. On it, it says, oil okay? A little reminder to check your oil. Oil okay? <laughs> and since we're around back, let's discuss the rear wiper, which is a rather large piece. So large, in fact, that the wiper arm connects to the tailgate in two separate places. So I was thinking, oh, are there two separate wiper arms? No, no. The two separate places, they eventually connect into one in a kind of needless complexity you can only get from a Porsche. Another interesting quirk about this car always was the sunroof, which has to have the smallest opening of any sunroof in the entire car industry. It only opens up about seven inches, which makes you wonder why they even bothered with a sunroof at all. Now, a lot of cars have storage in the door panel. Usually it's just something you throw stuff in. Sometimes it has a lid. In this car, not only does it have a lid, but it has a little latch you have to push in order to get it open. You push the latch, and only then can you access the door storage. The craziest thing about this is when it's closed and when you haven't unlatched it, you can still put stuff in there, which kind of renders the whole latch system moot. I bet if you asked Porsche engineers, they would say, yes, this is the most brilliant solution. All cars should have it. The rest of us just think it's kind of weird and needlessly complicated. The 928's door panel had some other weirdnesses too, like for example, the door panel mounted air conditioning vents and the sideways seat memory control button. But the strangest thing by far was the door lock circle thing. That would be this. Now this car has central locking, so you could automatically lock and unlock the doors. But if you wanted to unlock or lock an individual door, you didn't just pull up on the door lock. Instead, you twisted this circle, which is actually rather hard to twist. No idea why this happened, but it happened. 
Once you get inside the car, you start to notice a few of the other interesting quirks, like for example, the transmission selector. Now in some cars, when you shift into gear, the gear you're in lights up. Porsche decided they'd develop their own solution. There's a little triangle coming off the transmission selector that points to whatever gear that you're in. It's a rather novel solution to an interesting problem. Next up, we have to discuss the button that gets you into the trunk, which is probably my favorite piece of switch gear inside this car. It's not a latch or a lever anywhere in here. Instead, it's this weird rubber button down on the floor, and you don't push it, you pull it up, and now the trunk is open. Another interesting quirk of the 928, there's not that much storage space inside the cabin unless you count the trick over-engineered door pocket. So you get to the center console and you're thinking, yes, I finally have somewhere to put stuff. Except you open it up and, oh no, there is just not any space in there. Could probably hold a credit card. Maybe. So let's talk about the central locking button. This interior is a weird hodgepodge of shapes and colors and sizes as things were added throughout this car's 20 year production run. The lock button is a great example. It is bright red, it's backlit, and has a picture of the key on it. Everything else is black, but this particular button is red. When you push it, it's lit when the doors are locked and unlit when the doors are unlocked. Another strange switch in this car is the one that controls the windshield wipers, not the one that turns them on or off. That's just a stalk coming out of the steering column like in a normal car. Instead, it's the one that changes the speed of the intermittent wipers. It's actually a little dial hidden at the base of the instrument panel behind the steering wheel, and it's rather strange. Next up, we have to talk about these little buttons over here. The first one makes sense. It controls the headlights twisted and they go on. The next one controls the fog lights. The third one is completely unrelated to the headlights, and in fact, it's the odometer zeroing button. Hold it down and it zeroes the trip odometer. This has to be the single largest odometer zeroing button in world history. It's bigger than the button for the door lock. Also unusual, this car doesn't have some fancy electronic screen in the gauge cluster like most modern cars, but it does have a few functions. For example, if you pull a little lever to the left of the steering wheel, the entire car turns metric with the temperature reading in Celsius. Pull the lever again and the entire car turns back to miles and the temperature reading is back to Fahrenheit. One little dial to change to an entire measurement system and unit of temperature, but if you want to access the pocket on the door, you have to pull a little switch before you're allowed to lift the lid. Next up, let's talk about the back seats. Now, Porsche intended for this car to be a grand tour, a practical car you could use to take the whole family and see the world. Evidenced by the fact that they actually put some stuff back there. For example, there is a sun visor for the rear. Have you ever seen that in any car before? The rear passengers have a sun visor. The other interesting thing in the back seats is there are four climate controls for rear seat passengers. There's only six up front. And yet, in spite all that thought towards the rear, the back seats are actually really hard to get into, as I shall now demonstrate. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I'm glad they included four air conditioning vents and these sun visors because I could really use some extra comfort. Now, before I move on from the back seat, I want to touch on that sun visor one more time. I've moved the front seat all the way forward so I can be comfortable back here. And I'm going to go to put down the sun visor and <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> I now no longer think that this is a sun visor for the back seat passengers. Instead, I think it's a wall so that the front seat passengers can block out the back seat passengers and probably also the sun. But while the rear seats aren't big enough for any normal sized person, they do have one benefit. This car is supposed to be more practical than a 911. And indeed, there's a little bit more rear seat room, but also there's more room in the back. These seats fold down and then you have this entire cargo area to do with what you want, which you didn't have in the 911, of course, because it was rear engine. So now you know all about the 928. You know all about its weird quirks and features, which are surprisingly plentiful for a Porsche since they're usually so perfectly, meticulously engineered. But how does it drive? To find out, I'm going to take it out on the road. And for more of my thoughts, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've written a column about all of my thoughts on the 928 GTS. All right, so I'm getting in the car to drive it. And the first thing I've discovered here is that the entire gauge cluster and all the buttons on it move when you tilt the steering wheel. There's no telescope for the steering wheel, but even the turn signal stock moves in this thing. <laughs> This is crazy. Driving the 928 GTS, I've always wanted to drive one of these, actually. I've always kind of thought they looked cool, even though I know that the prevailing opinion is they kind of look dated. There is a Pontiac G5 behind us, though, so that's a very exciting experience. There's only about four of them. Of course, we're in Detroit. There's a hundred of those. There's an Oldsmobile Silhouette. There's Saab 97X. <laughs> I could just sit here and watch poorly selling American-made cars drive by. All right, <laughs> let's, let's drive. 
Now, I happen to be of the opinion that, for especially for the GTS model, the automatic was the correct transmission. Manual 928s are pulling more money now. This was intended to be the grand touring car for whatever that was worth. The automatic is the right transmission. It's a big, heavy front-engine V8 car. It's the kind of car you want to just put your foot down and go like a bullet. The road manners are, are pretty good at lower speeds. This car's actually pretty comfortable, even 23 years later. The weirdest thing about this car is the simple amount of force required to push the accelerator. You wanted to really commit to the accelerator before you uh, you were allowed to go anywhere, but you really have to deeply, and, and it's hard to push too, stab the throttle before you can get anywhere. Man, this car, this car, you know, it's only a four-speed automatic. And so it's dulled a little bit by that. I kind of wonder how this thing, this car has 350 horsepower. I wonder how it would feel if it had a good transmission. I drive so many of these older automatic cars like the Prowler that were just killed by their automatic transmissions. And it's such a shame because if you put a modern automatic in it, it would liven up the car to the point where it would have modern performance. The, the thing about this car, it doesn't build power furiously, but when you get high in that range, boy, it really makes some power. Uh, it isn't as fast, certainly, as you know, a modern sports car or something like that, but it has that grand touring car sort of, you get the sense that you could go 150 and not break a sweat kind of power building. Everything's very quiet. The car is actually really well insulated. It's surprising uh, how quiet it is when I'm driving it. It's, it's, uh, it's almost weird. They, they were able to do this 23 years ago. This is what the Panamera feels like. The steering is really heavy. Even though it's power steering, you have to really give it some effort in order to make it move. This is actually nice. I have to admit, driving down the street, I, most 23-year-old cars, no matter how nice they were, uh, they're a bit cumbersome in modern times. Cars from the early 90s, you don't want to be in them. This car has perfectly blowing AC, as nice as any modern car I've been in. The ride quality is pretty good. It's a little harsh, but this is Michigan where the roads are a little bad. The seats are tremendously comfortable. They have an enormous amount of support. Uh, they're, they're very soft leather. You feel like you kind of sit in them. This was really intended to be a touring car. Like all Porsches, this car feels very well put together, obviously, also. All the materials are pretty high, and there's some weird button placement and some odd things. Even though this car is 1994, there's no weird squeaks or rattles or shakes from strange places. The steering is just so heavy. It's almost amazing to me how heavy the steering was. You gotta remember, this car was designed in the 70s. It's just from a different era. For a 94 car, the steering just seems crazily heavy. Obviously, it lightens up when you start moving, but it still is heavier than any modern car. The thing that I'm kind of taking away from this experience is this car feels heavy. When you floor it, it, it takes a while to build power. The accelerator, you push it, it takes some time. The steering feels heavy. This car was, was uh, not intended to be the light, tossable sports car that a lot of Porsches today, and even Porsches back then, really were. It was no 911, this thing. And so that's the 928 GTS, but I'm not done quite yet. Earlier in this video, I told you the 928 intended to replace the 911, but it was saved at the last minute. Indeed, the 911 was saved by an American. This is a good story. I promise if you've made it this far, it's worth sticking around. Here's the situation. The American was named Peter Schutz, and he was Porsche's global CEO from 1981 to 1986. The story goes that the 911 was supposed to end production in favor of the 928, and Schutz was in a meeting with other Porsche executives in an office discussing the future of the brand. Morale was low, sales were off, and the workers all loved the 911, and they were sad it was going to be replaced. But the 928 was the hot new model, and that was was the next generation of Porsche. Sensing the feeling among his employees about this, Schutz walked up to a diagram on a wall in the office where they were meeting that showed all of the Porsche model life cycles with the 911 coming to an end soon. He stood up, grabbed a marker, walked up to the chart on the wall, and drew a line from the 911 off the chart and on to the wall in the office, prolonging the 911's life cycle indefinitely. Immediately after that, Porsche began retooling the 911 for a new generation rather than attempting to kill it off and replace it with the 928. This story is Porsche lore now, the guy who saved the 911 with a draw of a marker onto a wall, and who knows if it's really true, right? Well, it just so happens that a friend of mine is acquainted with Peter Schutz, who is now retired and living in Florida. And my friend went over to Schutz's house for dinner a couple of years ago, and he asked him the question, did you actually draw the line from the chart onto the wall and save the 911? Schutz's response was, you bet I did. And I was grinning like the Cheshire cat when I did it. And since then, the 928, intended to be the 911 replacement, has faded into obscurity, while the 911 is stronger than ever. And with story time over, it's time for the Doug score. 
Beginning with the weekend categories and styling, I don't like how a lot of the early 928s looked with their ugly early 80s wheels, and a lot of them were painted gold, but by the GTS, they had it pretty well down. It gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration, it did 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds, giving it a 5 out of 10. Handling is above average, but not on par with modern sports cars, and steering seems needlessly heavy. It gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is high. The 928 is rarely seen, and the GTS is particularly special. It gets a 7 out of 10. As for importance, this was a significant Porsche, one of the longest running models and a staple of the brand's lineup for almost two decades. The GTS is the most important version, so it earns a 7 out of 10. That gives it a total weekend score of 32 out of 50, placing it predictably below the modern sports cars I've already scored. Next up are the daily categories and features and equipment. The 928 GTS was pretty well equipped in its day, but this category is judged by modern standards and it's pretty sparse for 2017. It gets a mere 3 out of 10. Luxury measures comfort and the 928 is above average, but not hugely. It gets a 6 out of 10. Quality measures materials and reliability. Materials are nice, but there are some poor ergonomics and oddly placed buttons. Meanwhile, reliability is starting to become a little uncertain and potentially expensive as this car ages. It earns only a 5 out of 10. Practicality isn't bad. It has about 15 cubic feet of cargo space, giving it a 4 out of 10. It would earn extra points for those back seats, but they're just so small. Finally, value depends on why you're buying it. By modern standards, it's not an impressive performer or a great luxury car, especially given that nice ones can sell for more than $60,000, but I do think the 928 GTS will eventually be regarded as a valuable classic, and that's enough to earn it a 6 out of 10. That gives it a total daily score of just 24 out of 50, bringing the total 928 GTS Doug score to 56 out of 100. The 928 is a cool car, but it just can't hang with the modern stuff.